It's gorgeous stuff. I well, just I think started I saw, recording. I think I saw Art King flash pass. We got we have a nice bunch in my territory this time. This is good. There's also Australia. Yeah. I'm coming to visit you. In Greece. We've got some wow. in Greece. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. And they're <laughs> wonderful. You guys are so engaging. Thank you so much for chiming in. Sometimes we get a handful of people that will tell us where they're from and then everybody else likes to be incognito. So wonderful. We have, I feel like we have almost every state. Australia wins the long distance award. <laughs> That's right. Wonderful. Illinois, Washington, Florida. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, so, happy, so happy to have you online. Um, my name is Angela. Beautiful. I head up marketing communications with Marone Bio Innovations. And I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today, uh, Biologicals and Best Practices for Greenhouse Crops. This is a part two of a webinar series, two of two. So we did the first one in December and I'd love to hear, um, are there any visitors and are there any attendees today that were on our December webinar? We'd love to know that. Um, for those of you that are interested in watching the first webinar where we talk all about disease, I'll be sharing that link with you in just a few minutes. But today we're gonna be covering insects. Uh, it's my pleasure to Let's see if this will advance for me. There we go. Um, offer you continuing education credits. So we have the Certified Crop Advisors Organization. We've been approved for one integrated pest management credit. Uh, you can scan the QR code. You just open up your phone app, uh, your, your camera app on your phone, and you should be able to automatically log in with that QR code. Um, I will be checking chat throughout the webinar. So if you have trouble, let me know. But for the Certified Crop Advisors, uh, there's your tracking number and you can automatically scan in with that QR code. And then we have the other the California Department of uh, Pesticide Regulation, the California DPR, Oregon Department of Agriculture and Washington Department of Agriculture. So we have those codes there. Just go ahead and take a quick picture. You will all receive a copy of this presentation um, later today or tomorrow. So you'll have it you know, in your inbox as well. But just in case, I always like to take a picture. You never know what'll happen. So here's the link to our webinar. It's on our website. If you can all see the um, URL below, and again, this will come in your email, so you don't have to worry about saving it if um, you don't want to, but we have the, the part one presentation where we cover diseases that what happened in December. That is up on our website, and you can watch it at your convenience. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. So our first speaker is my colleague, Steve Bogash, who's located in the Eastern United States. He's a territory sales manager from our own bio. Steve began his, his career as the owner and operator of Greener Horizons, a garden center, nursery, greenhouse, and landscaping operation in Westminster, Maryland, before serving nearly 20 years as a horticulture educator and researcher for the Pennsylvania State University Cooperative Extension at state, in State College, Pennsylvania. Since retiring from extension service, Steve joined Marone Bio Innovations as their Northeast Mid-Atlantic Product Development and Territory Business Manager. His territory runs from Southern Virginia to Caribou, Maine, to the Western edge of Ohio. Steve oversees several dozen university and private research company product trials, as well as many on-farm demonstration trials for Marone Bio Innovations. One of the most exciting things about this stage in my life and career, says Steve, is helping to usher in the next wave of safe, effective biological pest management products. So Steve and his wife, Roberta, live in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where he's honing his carpentry skills, building wooden boats and renovating their home near the Susquehanna River built in 1933. So Steve, thank you for being on. Um, one of my favorite things, Steve is a, is a natural presenter and educator and just a wealth of information, obviously has direct um, industry experience with Greenhouse. So please um, pepper him with questions today, even if it's not directly related to the specific insects we're talking about today. We wanna be a resource for you on biologicals and the challenges you have in your greenhouse. Our next speaker is a biological expert, um, Dr. Matthew Breck. He is the founder of Dutch Valley Farms, a tier one cannabis grow operation in Estacada, Oregon. He's a dynamic and experienced sales and research professional with over a decade of experience with Syngenta, 
And now he's been with Marone Bio Innovations, where he heads up, heads up our cultivated garden division. So basically hemp, cannabis, and um, greenhouse operations. He has the Bachelor of Science in Biology from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. And he has a master's degree and a, a doctorate in plant pathology from the University of Florida. So Matt, thank you for being on. Um, Matt, Matt's expertise is in plant pathology, but he obviously works in all areas of cultivated garden. And he's uh, here to add some additional insight um, to your questions. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So as many of you know, uh, Barone Bio Innovations is a publicly traded company. This is our safe harbor statement in which we just encourage you if you have any interest in um, investing in the company that of course you do your own due diligence and not rely solely on this presentation to make your decisions. With that, Steve, I would like to hand it over to you where you will go ahead and introduce our company. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Um, Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are from. Um, nice to be here again today. And I just want to clarify, I appreciated uh, Angela's kind introduction. Uh, the boat building thing, that's that's three and a half years away with my retirement. I'm gonna, that's a skill I'm hoping to acquire, um, but I'll get there. Uh, so um, Kevin Helash is our CEO. Kevin took over uh, very recently. Uh, the company was founded in two th 2006. And in 2013, we ran the IPO on the company. Um, quite a bit different company now with a lot more products because originally Regalia was the primary product. Uh, we are headquartered out of Davis, California. We have a manufacturing plant we call 3M that's in Bangor, Michigan. And uh, we um, do quite a bit of manufacturing there and we're actually building that out at this point. So um, more and more of our products will be coming directly out of our own manufacturing plant. Uh, we are certainly nationwide, but also global. Um, we sell um, Marone products under a number of different names globally, and, we're, and those are, those, that footprint continues to expand. Uh, one of the things that a lot of the bio companies like to talk about is their, uh, their catalog or their library. And we've got over 18,000 microorganisms that we're constantly screening for various uses. It's a really interesting uh, process to take a bio from discovery to something that a grower can actually apply. Do I have control or do you? There we go. Okay. Um, so these, this is our product. This is our current product portfolio. Um, an awful lot of folks don't know Marone, but they know the product Regalia, which is what the, con the, con the um, company was built on. Um, so the portfolio has grown quite a bit um, over the years. Well, Regalia, our, uh, one of our fungicide, our SAR fungicide, Magistine, soil nematicide, insecticide, um, Stargus, our bacillus, um, Betriticide, powdery mildew material, downy mildew material. It's got a very broad spectrum. Pace setter, which is a row crop uh, biostimulant um, and uh, definitely helps the crop move along, but that's for the row crop market. Haven, our uh, reduced sun and heat stress product, does a really nice job in making more better tomatoes out of a field. If anybody wanted to talk to me about that, I'd be open. We've got some interesting research. Venerate and Grandivo are two insecticides and miticides. You'll be hearing a lot about them today because they definitely work in with a lot of these biological programs. And our parasitic, our parasitic acid line with jet egg and jet oxide. There we go. So um, back in, I believe it was October or, sept or late September, I went to Peachtree Farms, which is in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Peachtree has been a leader of biologicals and we shot a series of videos there. So I'm gonna let the videos do most of the talking because I'm gonna just be repeating it and I will go over some high points in between them. So Angela, let's get this one going. All right, I've uh, just let me know, we're gonna, can everybody hear the video? Just let me know if you can. Hi, I'm Steve Bogash, Northeast oh, Territorial good. Business Manager with Marone Bio. I cover from Southern Virginia to Maine and from Western Ohio to New Jersey and Delaware. I'm here at Peachtree Farms in Upper Bucks County, Pennsylvania, very near the New Jersey Pennsylvania border. Peachtree Farm has long been a leader in biological pest management, and they've always been willing to share their knowledge with other growers. The operation was originally created by Lloyd and Candy Traven in 1983, 
And since that time, their son Alex Traven has been an integral part of their operation, and he now operates as their head grower. Peace Tree creates and grows a wide variety of organic herbs, flowers, and other plants. Alex has been willing to give us a look under the hood here at Peace Tree and share with us their scouting and IPM operation. You can just keep on going. Well, they'll get to they'll get to hear Lloyd in just a moment. This is good. So, Lloyd, um, one of the more interesting things about your operation is watching how it's morphed over the years. When I first met you, you were selling a lot of begonias. Mm -hmm. You were supplying Philadelphia Flower Show, and herbs were a small part of your operation. Things have changed a lot. So what's brought about this huge change? Well, it's, it's always been a part of the operation because we've been growing herbs since our very first year. That was 1983. Were they organic then? They were not organic then. And uh, that's an in, that part of it's an interesting story. But we were very, very focused on building the ornamentals part of the business. Uh, we thought that that's where the bigger margin, the bigger money was going to be. And so we pushed that and developed uh, some very cool products over time. And when COVID hit this year, uh, it changed everything for us. We went, we went organic in uh, 2008, uh, which was a, a big move for us, a great move for us, but we never really leveraged it. This year, because we looked at it and said, the only people who are gonna be allowed to be open are gonna be people who sell food that we really thought that no garden center across North America would ever open up their doors to customers this year. And so we made an immediate switch over where we said we're gonna sacrifice all of the ornamental plants that we had propagated and were ready to plant because we're never gonna have a chance to sell them until May, June, July, whatever. And we made a complete switch to organic vegetable plants and more organic herbs. And we literally overnight made the change and could not keep it in stock. People wanted local, they wanted organic, they wanted their own gardens, they wanted to plant their own food because it's the only thing that they had any control over at that time. So I know that you are a grower partner with Wegmans. Is that what that the expression is? We're, we're a partner farm. Partner farm partner with farm. Wegmans. So how important has Wegmans been in that? And are, do you have other outlets for your organic herbs as well? We, we continue to have our other normal organic herb business, which has grown tremendously as well. Wegmans gets a very specific product that is sold only through them. That, that's the agreement we have with them is that that product is a Wegmans exclusive. And I do see your four inch basil in my local Wegmans yep. store. I have used a bit of it. That's good. We're, gl we're glad to hear it we, and we appreciate the support. But so we do have other outlets, but the key thing for Wegmans is that first of all, they support us, they're loyal, um, and they give us business twice a week, 52 weeks a year. It's every week of the year we ship to Wegmans. And uh, for a greenhouse, that's the holy grail, to have regular cash flow in the summer, in the fall, in the dead of winter, not just springtime. So in some of the work I've been doing with your son, Alex, we've seen the efforts that you guys go to to make sure that some of the beneficial insects you use don't last till they get to the store. You try and get as many off as possible. Obviously, that's not going to be 100%. So. <laughs> Consumers, my experience with consumer is a bug is a bug. How has, how has that worked out at the store level, both Wegmans and also garden centers, because they must encounter the occasional bug? So it's a lot easier with garden centers because they're used to talking to customers about insects. It's part of their regular thing. And we've gotten to the point with some of our customers where they will use the presence of a beneficial as a selling point. So they'll point it out to their customers and say, you get an extra benefit, you take this home with you to your garden. And uh, I will also say that that's 
not the norm. That's a pretty enlightened garden center. Sure. Um, it's, it's an issue because I remember talking to uh, Bill Calkins about this, and I said, well, we should be advertising this fact that we're using all biologicals, all these biorationals and, and, and biocontrol agents. And he said flat out, you never market the fact that you have bugs on your plants. You just don't do it. And while we think it's a great thing, the consumer, Mrs. Smith, does not like that. And Wegmans has a zero tolerance policy on insects, and they don't care. It's, an insect is an insect is an insect, and somebody's going to complain about it. So what we've come up with is a system where when the plants are on the bench and they take a flat that they're going to package, we take blowers and we blow those plants off with, a, with an electric blower to stir the insects off of them, drop them into the sleeve, cart them and put them in the building until we then put them unboxed on our truck overnight. So we're chilling them down a little bit, take the field heat off, we're giving those insects a chance to escape, to move on. They don't want to be cold, and they don't want to be in a sleeve. They want to fly. They want to live. Then the next morning, we blow them again, box them, palletize them, blow the pallets off, put them finally on the truck. And then it goes directly to Wegmans from there. And again, they look at every pallet, and they're looking for fungus gnats and things like that. So we figured that this process that we go through, it's a lot of extra steps. What was happening was you would open the box and, and whatever was stuck in there overnight sure. would fly out. That's all they saw, and they would reject an entire load because of that. Gotcha. So, so now let's, let's shift gears a little bit, and this is a very COVID-19 kind of a question. Mm -hmm. So that's going to make this interview very, time, very timely. Um, this is, things have changed a lot for your operation mm -hmm. since pre-COVID. I, I know the crystal ball has got to be really hard to look into now, but we're all trying to think post-COVID as well. With all the growth that you've done, where do you see, do you see this just being a continual march in this direction? Or is this a, just a way you're doing it now and you see something different after we get on the other side of this virus? I think sales-wise and marketing-wise, 2021 is going to look a lot like 2020 in terms of sales. Um, the past is gone for right now for a long time. So we've made that switch. So we are now nationally known as the organic source for retail-ready vegetables, and herb plants that can be shipped palletized all over the country. And we don't see that changing. People are still going to be avoiding all the public interaction. They're going to be avoiding people as much as they possibly can until we're on the other side of this. We're going to be so firmly established at that point in doing what we do that I don't think there's any going back to what we were doing. We're making a conscious decision now that we will entertain and look to produce any vegetable, herb, organic, sustainable type crop like lavender before we will do a typical ornamental. And so all of a sudden where, where everything used to be about the flower, now it's going to be about the green. And possibly and, the fruit. And the fruit as so, well. I know you all already do some figs. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember ever seeing like ever bearing strawberries. That they... we, we do strawberries in the spring. So you do strawberries oh, yeah. as well. The ever bearing types? Mm -hmm. or just, okay, ever bearing types. Um, blueberry plants? We don't. It Not... takes too long. Okay, too long of a cycle. Okay. Um, so the, you see this as the sustainable part of your operation? Oh, sure. And without sharing any of the big secret, because you've always been. Been really strong about introducing the next big thing. What can you share which is going to be the next thing you're going to be trying? Well, we've got, we've got two that we're coming out with this year, actually. One of them is a brand new lavender uh, that uh, we are really excited about. And the response in the marketplace has been just crazy. What's the name of it? It's called Sensational. 
Okay. And it really is sensational. It's really special. What's different about it? It has a the stiffest, straightest flower stem I've ever seen on a lavender, uh, and also the heaviest, thickest flower I've ever seen on a lavender. It literally, you can take it and you can shake it, and it doesn't move. It just is standing up straight. It's the best cut flower I've ever seen. Still before. draws pollinators? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. And hardy. Sure. Uh, so it's an intermedia, uh, a hybrid, um, sterile, doesn't reseed itself. It's a really good plant, and it looks good even when it's not in bloom. It's got a really nice foliage to it. So you well. said two. That's the lavender. Yeah. We have a fig that we're introducing. Uh, we love our figs, and uh, you know, we're at a point now where we grow enough figs in the upper greenhouse that I'm tired of eating figs. I mean, I'm done. And I have some that have been sitting in the fridge for about a week now, and it's just like, eh, not ready for it anymore. My wife would find you're getting tired of figs blaf blasphemous. Uh, I know. I, I, I totally understand it. And, uh, um, but anyway, we have a new one, and its name is Phenomenal, and uh, because we have a lavender phenomenal, of course. Um, this plant, the plants that we have in the upper range right now, are almost four years old. They're only this tall, 24 to 30 inches tall, and about the same spread on them. And if they have leaves, they have figs on them. Wow. It's crazy, and they ripen here. And so this is a plant that we're positioning. It's a true dwarf. We're positioning this as a plant that's gonna be in every condo, every apartment, college dorms when they're open again. Uh, uh, on tabletops, uh, it's going to be heavily marketed. It's just, it's just a crazy good plant. Awesome. Hey, yeah. well, thanks for a look sure under the thing. hood for where things going. Sure thing. Take care. Pleasure Thank seeing you. Very you. Much. All right. Awesome. So, so everybody's gotten to meet Lloyd at this point, and so uh, now um, Alex Traven, um, so their son and head grower, and Alex is going to be doing most of the. Uh, education today on insects and um, on insects and mites. So um, I did a, we did a series of interviews with Alex and so we're going to start talking about basic use and um, how to use um, uh, biocontrol agents and biopesticides together. Here at Peachtree, uh, what the big focus in pest control is on biological pesticides and use of uh, biological control organisms, also known as BCAs. So we're here talking with Alex. And Alex, what are we looking at right now? So uh, like you said, biological control is the main way that we're preventing pest outbreaks in our greenhouse. And uh, because we grow so many different things, we have so many different overlapping pest complexes that we try and use an ecosystem-based approach to biocontrol, where we're trying to establish populations of several different predators and parasites that are all present in the greenhouse at the same time. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that we're able to achieve that is through our use of banker plant systems. So we use three different banker plant systems, um, one of which the grass aphid bankers, I think a lot of growers will be familiar with. We don't use those in the summer, um, but in the summertime, we use these other two systems. The first is uh, purple flash ornamental peppers. So these are little tiny hot peppers. Um, and this plant kind of continuously flowers. And we use this as a banker plant for a small predatory bug called aureus. Uh, they're a really great predator of thrips and uh, basically anything they can find. The other system we're using is a mullen banker plant system. So this is mullen, common roadside weed that we cultivate and we raise populations of a predatory bug called Dicyphus on these. And uh, they're another really great generalist predator for um, white flies, aphids, um, basically, again, anything that they can catch. So what we're trying to do is make sure that we have lots of different predators that are all kind of overlapping and redundantly taking care of a lot of those predator, of those pest insects. So I noticed you have a sachet on there. So I do. I, I was kind of surprised to see a sachet on a banker plant. So what are you using that for? That's a great question. 
So one of the things I always try and drive home for people is that banker plants really need some dedicated attention. So they're not necessarily the best choice for every type of grower. You can't just put these out in the greenhouse and completely forget about them. Even though they've got these great generalist predator insects on them, they can still be susceptible to certain other types of pests. So while the Dicyphus is really great at finding aphids and, and things like that, it's not great at managing thrips. So I'm still using Amblyceus cucumeris to control thrips on those very same plants. So what you don't want to have happen is to raise these banker plants and then have them become a source of pests as well. So there's a lot more to managing banker plants than just putting them out there and letting things happen. There is, and it's been a really long learning process for us, but we've, uh, we've come up with a lot of different techniques for making sure that they're working effectively in our system. And um, another thing that I like to say is that these plants, even though they may be ugly and I may never actually sell them throughout the season, they're the most valuable plants I grow in any given year. And the way that I'm calculating that is you can compare what does a vial of this, of this insect cost if you were to buy it from a beneficial insect provider versus how many can I produce on one of these plants. And uh, you, know, you, might, you might get these astronomical figures where I could produce hundreds to even thousands of beneficial insects off of one of these plants, meaning that the savings in not having to buy in insects constantly makes them one of the most valuable plants I grow. That's interesting. So I know you don't get perfect control this way. Mm -hmm. So I, we're, I, I have some questions about how you integrate biopesticides or organic pesticides mm -hmm. with this system. So I, one of the big ones is obviously we don't spray these plants. Mm -hmm. do, do you ever apply any pesticides to these plants? Um, occasionally. So for example, the mullen actually gets a, uh, there's a species of caterpillar called the mullen caterpillar that in the summertime when the roof is open, those moths will come in, lay eggs on the mullen, and we'll start to get these little caterpillars that can kind of damage the mullen plants. So I'm still able to use products like BT on these mullen plants without affecting the uh, predatory insects because BT is highly specific to targeting caterpillars. So that's an example of how I am using them. In general though, I really try and not apply any insecticidal products to these banker plants. Um, and banker plant systems are really great too because they can be a reservoir for population. So even if I need to come in and spray my crops, I'm usually able to keep my banker plants somewhere separate so that after I spray the crop, there's still a good source of those beneficial insects that can get right back into the crop. So we know that Grandivo and Venerate are compatible with most BCAs. Mm -hmm. So have you ever gone in and while you're using the banker plant system, applied either of those materials to manage pests that you're just not getting that level of control of? I definitely have. Um, yeah, there, there's definitely times with certain crops where the thrips pressure, for example, is so high that in order to in order to be able to get that crop to a sellable to a sellable size, um, I need to come through with some treatments of things like Grandivo uh, or Venerate, and um, they're definitely really soft on, especially um, beneficial mites and uh, some other things like lace wings seem to be totally unaffected by them. A few of these other bugs that I raise are a little bit more sensitive to pesticides, like the Dicyphus in particular is very, very sensitive to pesticides and even some of the biological ones. But again, what I'm trying to achieve is a lot of redundancy in my system. So that even if one of my beneficial insects is, is getting reduced in population, I still have a lot of other stuff in place that can make sure um, that, I'm, that I'm taking care of those pests. So I've known you for quite a while. I've worked with your mom, Candy, and father, Lloyd, for quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Your father, at a meeting I was at, once castigated a large number of organic <laughs> growers for their reliance on pyrethrums and spinosad materials. Mm -hmm. Yet they are a pretty serious and constant use material for a lot of organic growers. Where do they fit into your production system, those kind of materials? That's, a, that's another good question. So, um, so those two products that you mentioned, pyrethrins and spinosins, there are two, two classes of chemicals for which there is organic certified options available. 
Um, but they are very strong, broad spectrum insecticides. They will kill most any insect that they come into contact with, especially a lot of these biological control organisms like aureus and disiphus that I've mentioned. So those types of products, while I do periodically need to get them out, they are a last resort nuclear option to me. The way I consider it is if I am spraying a crop with, with spinosad, I am aborting my biocontrol program entirely on that crop. So usually that's a situation where it's say two weeks before a crop is supposed to go out and I'm seeing a pest population just get out of that economic threshold zone where I can tolerate it and I don't see good numbers of my beneficial insects taking care of it. At that point, I might make the decision to go the nuclear route as I describe it and, uh, and spray that. But uh, really, it's, it's never more than one bench at a time or one particular group at a time. And uh, I could probably count on my hands the times I've used those products in the last year. So do you relegate them to the same status that, that your father does where they are crutches and purely only for rescue treatments? I would say, I don't know if I would be so strong as to say that they're crutches for growers, but what I see a lot of times is that there's a lot of certified organic growers who are doing what we call replacement farming. They're just replacing a synthetic pesticide with an organic one, sure. and their system is not biologically driven still. And in that regard, they are a crutch. Um, but by the same token, you know, organic growers do need to have something and uh, you know th these products are definitively much safer for humans and much um, they have much less residual activity in the environment as compared to a lot of the synthetic chemicals that people are using like organophosphates or neonicotinoids. So just to summarize what we were just looking at, as you could um, hear from Alex, um, they push a full ecosystem approach, that combination of uh, banker plants, releases of biocontrol agents, and um, of course, biopesticides. Um, they, they were some of the first people I saw using banker plants. And I've actually tried um, using the um, black, um, black leaf peppers, the earlier ones, um, um, for aureus management. It actually works really well in a pepper house. Um, you can put a whole line of them in and the aureus will do a really nice job of keeping most of the small sucking and rasping insects off. Um, the pyrethrums and spinosids, um, because they are so hard on beneficials, um, they're definitely one of the last choices and we've got a lot of other ways to go. So introducing the uh, Marone product Grandivo CG, um, so it is a chromobacterium subsugae and spent fem fermentation media. Um, we sell that as a water dispersible granule. It goes into solution really easy. We've looked at it for against a number of beneficials and pollinators, very, very low risk. Um, insect death occurs in four to seven days. You don't see that, um, that fast knockdown that you get from pyrethrum, but uh, they stop feeding almost immediately. Um, and so um, you get a you get a rapid control from them, from, from Grandivo. And that feeding, that's really the, the big secret there. Next slide. So this is how Grandivo works. I'm personally always fascinated um, by how materials work. So the first mode, mode of action is agitation and repellency. Um, insects just don't settle down. Um, you get this dust, gut disruption. That's a nice way of saying the insects can't hold anything in their gut. Um, they throw up and reduces fecundity. Um, so you immediately start seeing a population reduction, which is why this is these materials are part of a full program. You don't spray them on because you want to see everything knocked down really quick. Um, but the feeding, um, aphid feeding, white fly feeding, mite feeding um, stops in seconds after you spray it on. So you do get that, you just don't get that satisfying death so, so fast. And here are some of the um, pests and the labels, of course, at our website, uh, but it's certainly a part of any kind of a program for thrift aphids, a wide variety of mites. 
um, army worms, lepidoptera, that's a little repetitive, um, white fly, psyllids, and mealybugs. And uh, we have a growing library of research so you can contact. We'll, we'll give you all of our contacts at the end of this. Um, so if you have any, in, in, if you're looking for any information um, for your particular problem, contact us. We'll do our bit. Uh, we'll do our best. And somebody's asking about broad mites, and I have found rotating between Grandivo and Venerate does a really nice job on broad mites, and they're tough. Just make sure you're using the surfactant. Next, that was that was in our chat room. So let's look at uh, inspecting and using BCAs, and when they arrive, what do you do next? So every week I receive a shipment of live beneficial insects. Uh, my main provider is Beneficial Insectary and they've consistently provided me with really great stuff. I wanna run through a couple of the things I do every time I receive beneficial insects because I think they might be helpful to other growers. So the first thing that you wanna do is do, you get your packing list, make sure everything that you ordered is there. And uh, the next thing that you're doing is basically a quick quality control check. If you've got a provider, if you've got a provider that you're really comfortable with, you can start to take a take a you know their consistency a little bit for granted. But it's always good to at least double check, especially if you've got really extreme weather conditions. If it's been really hot or really cold, you want to just make sure that these things haven't sat out somewhere in shipment and that they're still going to be of high quality. So I'm going to get some of these things out of the box here and then start taking a look. Okay, so um, just some quick quality control tips. Obviously, one of the first things you can look at is, are these ice packs that they're shipped with still cold and solid? If everything is still cold, that's a really, really good sign. There's definitely been a few times over the years where because of something maybe sitting on the tarmac at an airport, you open this box up and it's just room temperature. That's a really bad sign. So these are cold and solid and everything's good. Um, so we're going to go through here and just kind of uh, take a quick look at, at some of the items and just make sure we've got good efficacy. Some of the items are really big and easy to see and easy, easy to visualize. Um, these are some um, Delodia uh, rove beetles. These are a soil predator. So I can just pop the lid on here and I should see these guys flying around already. And you can see a bunch flying all over my hand. I'm satisfied with that. I know those are going to be good to go. Uh, this container here is uh, a soil predatory mite. And uh, these guys are a little bit smaller, but um, they're pretty easy to see as well. So I'm going to get out my trusty hand lens real quick. I'm going to take a little, little scoop of this material. I'm going to take a look at it under the lens and just look for some activity and see these mites crawling around in here. Yep, so I've seen a bunch of activity in here. I'm pretty happy with that. Obviously, there's times where you want to do a much more thorough quality control inspection. And uh, I know a lot of growers will frequently do more uh, quantitative uh, assessments of these things where they're actually trying to count if the correct number is in here. Like I said, I have a really good relationship with Beneficial Insectary, and I've come to really trust their products. So these are uh, lacewing larvae in this package. These are also something that'll be visible with the naked eye. And uh, we'll just pop the bag open here and take a look. And so already right on the inside of the bag, I can see a lot of these guys crawling around. Another thing I use a lot of is uh, parasitic wasps. So I've got both Aphidius colmani and Aphidius irvi here. And um, these are things that really start to emerge once they start to get warm. And uh, as I'm pulling these out of the box, I can already start to see some live individuals emerging in here. And then some of the other things we're getting are a lot of uh, several different species of predatory mites. These are a lot smaller. You definitely do want to make sure you're mixing the material up, and then you can take a look under a lens and see if you've got good activity in there. So 
So any biocontrol agent provider will include some really good directions uh, and guidelines for how to use these different products. And uh, these are something you really want to pay attention to. You've spent a lot of money on these, in, on these organisms, so you really want to make sure that you're getting the most out of your investment. The ways that you distribute these organisms, including the timing and locations of application, are going to be a huge determinant of how successful you are with them. Have you? Unmute me. Um, there we go. <laughs> so, just to review what we were just doing, I'm certainly a high quality supplier. Make sure that you inspect your BCAs upon the receipt. Watch your temperatures. Um, it's uh, if you're new to using BCAs, you need to be very aware of which bug to use in different temperature ranges. There are some great websites out there. Um, that will give you a lot of background information on that. I work with a consultant to get started. I think it's a much safer way to go. Um, and make sure that your shipping crate temps are, um, are satisfactory when you arrive. I like the ones that come with the little recorder in inside so you can actually see how, how high the temperature got. Both Grandivo CG and Venerate CG are soft on beneficials. We continue to do research in our list of uh, beneficials, biocontrol agents that we know our products are safe with continues to grow. And you can always touch base with any Marone person and we'll get you that specific information. Oh, and here's the current list. I forgot that we had this slide in here. So here's the current list of uh, uh, beneficials that we know um, that um, both Grandivo and Venerate are safe with. So let's look at root aphids, which is where a lot of this started from. Um, one, of the, one of the first things I did when I was visiting Peachtree oh, a year or so ago, might even have been two years, um, was uh, they were unloading some plants coming in. And the first thing that Alex was doing was inspecting them for root aphids because he suspected that it was a problem. And this is a constant problem that um, a lot of us tech folks in the field, we get calls about managing root aphids, especially in cannabis crops but they seem to be more common in an awful lot of other ornamentals as well. So let's take a look at managing um, root aphids. With COVID-19 this year, uh, we saw an immediate increase in demand for herbs and vegetables and anything edible. But additionally, we saw a really big increase in demand for house plants. With everybody staying at home, people have really wanted to make their home spaces a lot more special. So we've introduced a line of um, curated house plants that we're propagating in house that we call our house geeks. So one of the pests that is commonly dealt with on things like succulents and house plants uh, are root aphids and root mealy. And they've really been increasing over the last couple years. Um, these have also been a really big issue in the cannabis industry as well. So thankfully, because we're propagating a lot of this material in-house, we've been able to really keep root aphids and root mealy out and have a really good zero tolerance policy for them. However, if you're getting plants in, especially from Florida, sorry to throw Florida under the bus, but if you're getting plants in from warmer climates like Florida, there's a really good chance that you're going to have things like root aphids and root mealy coming in that soil. So uh, in scouting for these plants, of course, what you're gonna look at is the root zone of the plants. And uh, having a lens here is really, really helpful. Thankfully, a lot of times, things like root aphids and root mealy will be apparent right on the outside of the root ball. So you're gonna wanna zoom in. Just like with scouting for aphids on other plants, a lot of times the first thing you'll see with root aphids is those white shed exoskeletons that you can sometimes see. A lot of times the root aphids themselves are a muddy brown color and it's really difficult to pick them out, especially in certain soil mixes or in any plant that has root nodules and that kind of thing. Uh, root mealy, of course, looks a lot like regular mealy bugs. They're bright and white and they leave this mealy residue behind. Um, and with those, a lot of times you'll be able to see lingering white spots on the inside of pots. That's something that I definitely look for if I'm looking for root mealy. 
Um, so with root mealy and root aphid, treatment is definitely difficult because it's hard to get really good coverage of something that you're applying to the root zone. Um, but one of the products that now has a good label for, for dealing with root aphids and root mealy in particular is Grandivo. Um, so you can do apply it as a soil drench and be able to get pretty good coverage and uh, cannabis growers especially have been having really good results with that. Keep the brain on mute. So um, the, for scouting, look for those white exoskeletons. Um, we've conducted some research with uh, Stanton Gill and Brian Kunkel, University of Maryland and University of Delaware, and uh, they've developed a really interesting scouting program. Um, as they were um, doing research for us, they had to do counts on these cells, and so they have figured out pretty much how to get a good idea of what the population count is. For management, um, Grandivo does a great job. Um, uh, drench, you drench the roots thoroughly. You want to repeat weekly until you don't see any signs of reinfestation, and you are drenching them all the way down. And I see somebody's on stand in Brian's team. Must be one of the people who counts mealybugs for us. All right, let's talk about aphids now. Everybody's favorite pest. We're taking a look at these uh, Ipomoea sweet potato vines uh, scouting for aphids and some other pests right now. Um, with dealing with aphids, it's really important to have at least a basic understanding of aphid biology. So aphids reproduce asexually. Every single aphid is itself a potential infestation. They are born pregnant and uh, they give birth um, without ever needing to mate or anything. So if there's even one aphid left behind, you have a potential infestation on your hand. Um, looking for so on these plants, these are really cool. They're a new variety of um, Ipomoea sweet potato vines um, called the Treasure Island series. And what's really cool about these is they have really nice ornamental Ipomoea sweet potato vine leaves that people are familiar with, but these ones will actually produce edible, high value culinary tubers as well. So you get the benefit of the ornamental plant as well as at the end of the season, a harvest of, uh, of, of real good food. So it really is that edible ornamental thing that we're really all about here. And uh, these will be new to the market next year. So um, as anybody who's ever grown Ipomias knows, they are definitely a magnet for aphids and some other pests as well. Um, so today I'm looking for aphids in these plants and rather than looking for the aphids initially, the way that I usually like to scout for aphids and the thing that I normally notice before I actually see the aphids themselves is some of their, uh, some of their shed skins. So um, I was looking through here and I found some and I don't know if we'll be able to see on the camera here, but what you notice first is there's these small white shed exoskeletons of the aphids. They grow really quickly and they're constantly shedding those exoskeletons. And even when you have a small population, there'll usually be more of those highly apparent white exoskeletons left behind than actual uh, aphids on there. The second really important thing to understand about using biological controls for aphids is that you really need to identify what species of aphid you're dealing with. So on these, uh, I've got these very large green aphids um, with, with long antenna, and um, they have a darker stripe running right down the middle of their back. That's a really good diagnostic feature to tell me that these are potato aphids. Um, this is not something to be taken for granted. So for example, if you're growing lettuce and have, le and have aphids on there, those are not necessarily lettuce aphids. You need to do the due diligence of figuring out specifically what species of aphid you're dealing with because that is going to help determine what type of biological control agents will actually target those aphids. So these potato aphids, uh, as well as a couple other species of large bodied aphids like foxglove aphids, have been really tough for growers using biological controls over the last couple years because their large body size means that 
Aphidius colmani, the most commonly used parasitic wasp, is too small to parasitize these aphids. So um, that's the type of uh, aphid that we're normally raising with an aphid grass banker system. But again, they really aren't going to target these aphids. So they've really been a thorn in the side of a lot of growers. Um, so there are, there's another species of parasitic wasp, Aphidius irvi, that will target these. However, there's as of yet not a reliable banker plant system to raise Aphidius irvi. Um, a couple people are working on them right now. We'll be trialing a system for raising those parasitoid wasps this year, but uh, it's still something that's very much in the research and development. So um, in scouting for these again, I noticed the uh, white exoskeletons first. Some other early signs of uh, aphid presence that you might notice are um, shiny, sticky uh, residue, which is called honeydew, and that's an excretion of the, of the aphids. So you'll sometimes see sticky uh, or shiny patches on, on the leaf surface, and sometimes that will get moldy as well with what we call sooty mold. Um, so another thing that I'll also be looking for at the same time uh, in terms of making a decision of whether or not I'm going to spray or how I'm going to intervene with these aphids is I look for the presence of biocontrol agents. So something else I found on here is this right here is a ladybug larva. Um, this is something that comes into the greenhouse on its own, but it shows me that I've got at least a little bit of activity uh, controlling these aphids. Um, I would also be looking for parasitized aphids to see if I've got activity from those uh, parasitoid wasps I was just mentioning. So um, in most cases, these, uh, these potato aphids in particular are really difficult to control with biocontrol agents. Because I'm raising these plants for stock production purposes, my economic threshold is very low. It's very important that these plants stay insect and disease free. And again, these potato aphids are very difficult to control with biocontrol agents alone. So at this point, I'm thinking about making a pesticide application decision. Conventional growers have a lot of things at their disposal. Aside from neonics and all the nuclear options, they have selective feeding inhibitors, which are really great products that can knock back a population of sucking insects like these without doing too much harm to biocontrol agent populations. They can be compatible with a biocontrol program. Uh, some organic options include pyrethrins, which will definitely do a good uh, amount of damage to the population of these aphids, but unfortunately they're going to kill every single biocontrol agent that's present here. They would really shut down the biocontrol program and are largely incompatible with running a biocontrol program in the future. So I want to look at some more biopesticide options. Um, some things that are available are things like um, oils or safer soap, uh, as well as a lot of biopesticide products like Grandivo or Venerate or Botanigard. Uh, a lot of these myco or biological insecticides can do really good um, damage to these pests without doing too much harm to biocontrol agents as well. One of the great things about them too is that even right after you make an application uh, with those, with those biopesticides, there's not a whole lot of residual activity. So for example, you can make an application on Tuesday, do some damage to the population, and then reintroduce bugs on Thursday without, without any harm. Um, a lot of those products work really well as tank mix partners as well. So you can get some extra efficacy on something like a safer soap or, um, or uh, horticultural oil or something like that as well. So let's review real quick. Um, Alex obviously is looking for white exoskeletons, the spent exoskeletons. If you're new to that and trying to figure out the difference between a white fly and an exoskeleton, the exoskeletons don't fly away when you wave your hand over them. Um, we want to identify the best treatment. You're looking for that sticky residue, um, the um, honeydew that aphids put out. And obviously, we're always looking to make sure that we've got the right beneficials in place. 
Um, Alex was talking, he started getting into tank mixes when it ended. Um, one of my favorite mixes is Grandivo or Venere plus an insecticidal soap. And there are a number of insecticidal soaps on the market. Um, you can mix these products also with Bavaria Bassianis, and there are a number of those out there. Um, I do have the Aza materials listed here. And there's quite a number of ASA materials. Um, if you are running a biocontrol agent based program, so you have a, a beneficial based program, you probably want to leave the ASA directins out of this consideration. Um, they've been noted by a number of uh, consultants who, are, who work in that area as being a great way to crash a beneficial program by including an ASA in there. But if you're running an all spray based program, I think the ASAs have got a really strong place. So what is venerate? Um, this is a liquid material. Uh, it's Burkholder rhinogensis. Um, it is not alive. Um, the material is heat killed before it leaves our factory. Um, works on a lot of uh, foliar feeding pests, soft-bodied insects, piercing and sucking insects. It is an IGR-like mode of action. So it's going to degrade the exoskeletal structures, um, interfere with, the, um, with molding, and of course you get that gut disruption. Don't have an IRAC code yet, and there's no label prohibitions. Uh, we'll be talking about the JAR test at one point, but as you're moving these kind of uh, materials into your program um, and you want to integrate them with other materials, always do a JAR test before you apply them, um, and then apply it to a small amount of your crop. That way you, you know that your material is both safe and effective. Here's some of the pests that it control, and there's a lot more on the label. The label is quite expansive. Uh, Venerate is the newer of our bioinsecticides, and the label is constantly on revision. Let's talk about a review how it works. We've got this exoskeleton degradation, um, so it works against both uh, adults and nymphs. Molting interference, that's the IGR-like activity. If they can't molt, they can't move on and they can't make more. And then you get the, uh, by ingestion, especially when they're doing uh, preening or cleaning themselves, um, grooming, um, they, 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 they will take it in by injection and it rapidly kills them that way. Some slides from our lab. If it can't get to the end, if it can't make more of them, it's not a pest. So let's talk about white flies now with Alex. Another really common pest that growers have to contend with is white flies. Uh, just like with aphids, there's a couple different species of white flies, and if you're using biological control organisms like parasitic wasps, you want to be sure what species you have because that will determine which species of parasitic wasp will actually target them most effectively. Um, so in scouting for white flies, the first thing that's important is knowing what kind of things white flies are really attracted to. Uh, from years of experience, I know that white flies really love things that are yellow or chartreuse in color. It's just a weird phenomenon, but they really seem to be attracted to those types of plants. Um, Ipomoea, of course, is something that they definitely like. So uh, in scouting for these, one of the first things you can look for is the presence of adults. And they're called white flies because they are little tiny bright white flies. They're usually pretty easy to see. So one of the things when you have something like this is you can just ruffle the canopy and see if you see any adults emerging. So thankfully, I don't see any here. The next thing you want to look for is the presence of eggs and larvae on the undersides of leaves. So in looking through these, I'm really not seeing anything as far as white flies, but they are a, con a continuous concern and something you need to be scouting for regularly. White flies are something that can really explode in population quickly if you're not paying attention. And the adults in particular are really hard to get control of. So it really pays to be looking ahead and if you're seeing one or two adults, see what kind of population you have of those larvae and eggs because that's gonna determine what you're gonna have a week from now. Um, in terms of prevention, a really good biocontrol program can do a really good job of controlling white flies, in a, especially in a greenhouse setting. 
White flies are one of the first things that we started using biological controls for back when we used to grow poinsettias. Um, so uh, again, for prevention, you really want to be targeting applications to taking care of those larvae and eggs on plants. Fortunately, if you need to make a spray decision, there's a lot of biologically compatible products that are effective for white fly larvae. Um, you can use things like safer soap or um, uh, horticultural oils, any suffocant type product like that is really good for the larvae. And products like Grandivo and Venerate are also really effective, especially when tank mixed with those other products. Again, the good thing about those is that even if you knock back your biologicals a little bit making an application, there's not a lot of residual activity. So you can get back in there quickly with uh, reestablishing populations of biologicals. getting the onion in between. Um, so um, just going back over some of the things that Alex said, white flies are attacked, attracted to yellow and chartreuse. Um, the adults are very easy to spot for. You just shake the canopy and there they go. It's very easy to scout on your leaf for eggs and larva. You've got to stay on top of them. If their population explodes really quickly. And for all these, whether you're using BCAs, biopesticides, or a combination, you stay out front on these guys. Um, white flies especially will get out of hand really quickly. Um, you'll see the same thing, Grand Evo and Venerate rotated combined with soap soils and Bavaria bassianae um, and other tank mix partners um, can be a really effective program. Um, I've often used them in tomato houses, pepper houses, and cucumber houses, uh, alternating between the two of them, but always mixing them with a tank mix partner and a spreader, if not including the soap um, in there. Um, always put a spreading, a spreading agent in there as well. First time you do it, just as a reminder, this is covering myself, um, always jar and crop test any new tank mix. So let's talk about Western flower thrips. One of the most persistent challenges for me as a culinary herb grower is dealing with Western flower thrips. Um, so despite the name, Western flower thrips are not exclusive to flowering crops. There are a lot of uh, uh, vegetative crops that they really like as well. Um, one of the ones that I really struggle with is um, some of these re uh, really, really resinous herbs like uh, rosemary, which I've got right here. Now this is one where the normal biological control organism, Amblyseus cucumeris, does not like to estab establish itself on herbs like this that have a lot of resin and oil to them. And this can be a challenge on other things like sage, thyme, and I believe in cannabis as well. Um, so when you get a lot of th high thrip population, what you'll start to see is a lot of uh, leaf stifling damage. You'll see some weird curly distortions in the growth. And even if you can uh, then knock back that population, a lot of times the damage will be permanent and you still won't be able to market that crop. So for us, uh, in dealing with Western flower thrips on these types of plants, prevention is really, really important. We start uh, our biocontrol program literally as soon as one to two days after cuttings are stuck of these types of plants. And we're making sure that even in propagation, we've got sachets of Amblyseus cucumeris on these plants. We're also heavily using uh, nematodes like Steiner Nema feltii regularly. So scouting for thrips can be um, a little bit challenging because they are very small and can be really innocuous to, to see. So uh, a lot of the same strategies of knocking out plants and flowers onto a white piece of paper will make them really apparent. Um, but a lot of times, unfortunately, the first thing you're going to see is some of the damage from them. So um, on crops where it's really difficult to run a good biological control program like rosemary, um, there's, you're going to need to be using some types of biological products. Uh, oils, safer soaps, again, suffocant products can be really effective. 
Um, but a lot of the a lot of products like Grandivo and Venerate again are going to be really great tank mix partners for knocking back that population of Western flower thrips. Again, prevention is really key. You have to understand in the biology of these that if you're using biological control organisms like predatory mites, they really only target the very early life stages of the thrips. So if you're waiting, if you're waiting after plants come in or after your sticking cuttings, if you're waiting more than three to five days, you might miss an entire life cycle where you have the eggs and those early larvae that the uh, mites can actually target. So you really have to be early if you're gonna use a biological control program for these. So Western flower thrips are really what got me started working with biological agents long before I went to work for Marone. I was working for Penn State Extension and getting a lot of complaints about Western flower thrips in tomato houses. And so that's actually where all this, where, where the work that I've been doing started from um, using Grandivo in programs because spinosad or spinodoram were the primary uh, materials for Western flower thrips. And uh, unfortunately, you see a rapid buildup of resistance in those pests when you apply them over and over again. So there's the, the uh, best practices review from Alex. Remember, one of the big ones here is they uh, biocontrols work for the early stages only. Um, but uh, by tank mixing, you can control some of the later stages as well for, with biopesticides. You'll see the same thing. Tank mixes combined with soap, soils, Bavaria bassiana, and of course, always jar and crop test anything before you use it. So let's talk about fungus nets. Any propagator knows that fungus gnats and shore flies aren't the most difficult to manage pests, but if left unmanaged, they can be absolutely disastrous. My single largest mistake I ever made as a grower involved fungus gnats and squash seedlings. Won't go too far into that right now. So I've learned a lot about managing fungus gnats. And again, with like a lot of other pests, prevention is key. Uh, nematodes like Steiner Nema feltii and Steiner Nema carpocapsi are very, very effective at controlling fungus gnats as long as you keep the population under control. What they won't do is if you wait until you have a disastrous population of them, they're not going to immediately get it under control. It's important to understand that those products only target the larvae in the soil. They do nothing for the adults. Um, there's also products like Natrol that are available that can help control um, fungus gnats in particular. We also use some biocontrol agents like um, rove beetles and predatory soil mites as well that we're applying regularly on a weekly basis with every new crop that we put out in propagation, we're immediately applying uh, those biocontrol agents and then keeping the uh, nematodes on a really tight rotation as well. So as much as I would like to suggest a Marone product for fungus gnats, um, we do not have anything that works well on fungus gnats at this point. Um, so make sure you're staying ahead of them. Generally, what most folks are doing are uh, drenches with beneficial nematodes. They are by far the gold standard for, man for managing fungus gnats. Um, Natrol is out there. It's a, a Bacillus thuringiensis, or Israeliensis, and only works on the larval form. So you're not gonna get that knockdown um, effect from it, but it can work. Um, what I hear from folks is that uh, the BTI works for a while and then seems to falter and they go back and st um, start working with beneficial nematodes. So spider mites now from Alex. I'm here with a crop of figs, and right now at the end of summer, you can see some lingering damage from spider mites. Um, so spider mites tend to be an issue primarily in the summertime during hot weather. Uh, and I pretty much without fail will get these guys going after figs and other woodier, longer term crops. They also like succulents, strawberries, and um, can, be, can be an issue for a lot of different crops over the, over the year. But again, these guys really, really love hot weather. 
uh, in scouting for spider mites, the first thing that you're going to start to see is some really minor stifling damage on the leaf surface from, from the feeding sites. And when in, infections start to get to really, really high rates, what you'll start to see is webbing. If you've already let your problem get to the point where you have webbing on your plants, it's pretty far gone at that point, and you're going to really have to do something serious about it. The really, really scary thing about spider mites is just how quickly they can increase in population. A population of spider mites can double within the span of a week during really hot weather in the summer. Another really difficult thing about them is that once you get temperatures above about 85 or 90 degrees, some of the biological control agents that we rely on, like Phytocelius persimilis, will start to be really ineffective once you get too hot. So the population of these can really run away quickly. In scouting for spider mites, you want to make sure to take a good look uh, with your lens again, at the, especially the undersides of leaves. And that's where you're going to start to look for not just your spider mites, but how many eggs of the spider mites you're seeing, and then looking for your predators, like Phytocelius persimilis, which I just mentioned. Uh, in addition to persimilis, we use Californicus for these, um, and that's especially effective once you start to get towards higher temperatures. Another issue that a lot of growers have been seeing increasing over recent, over recent years is broad mites and russet mites. I don't have any damage of those that I can show you, but with broad mites, they're so tiny that literally the only way to see them is with a real microscope. Um, what you'll see usually is starting to see some really intense growth distortion uh, right at the growing tips, and things will start to get crinkly, and um, we'll, we'll show some images of those. But um, they've become an issue, and uh, I, I would definitely say I've seen those increasing in the past couple years coming in on propagation material and plants from other places. And again, they're so small that it's really impossible to effectively scout for them thoroughly on things coming in. Uh, a good biocontrol program, including lots of generalist predatory mites, can really help to keep them under control, but getting 100% control of those is really, really difficult. Uh, spray options for spider mites. Again, things like safer soap and horticultural oils can be really good at, at being a suffocant, but um, Grandivo is a product that I use regularly in tank mixes for control of spider mites. Another good product that's on the market now that I'd mentioned is uh, TetraCurb from Kemen, and uh, that's a rosemary oil product. So the really great thing is when you combine that with something like Grandivo, it can really help improve coverage and it'll improve the efficacy of both products in that situation. Steve, you're on mute. Mike, you're looking for stippling damage and webbing. Um, by the time you get to substantial webbing, you've pretty well lost that crop at that point. I have been in, um, especially tomato houses where you it just, you see this fine, fine webbing everywhere. You've got to stay way ahead of them. In hot weather, they multiply incredibly quickly. There's nothing a spider mite does not like better than an irrigated crop um, in hot weather. And you're always looking at the bottom of the leaf. Um, you can see them without a hand lens, but it's always nice to have a hand lens to speed this up a little bit. And you'll see Grandivo used in those same combinations. Um, we found that for small sucking and rasping insects, uh, by using Grandivo and or Venerate in these tank mixes and rotating them, um, you not only get resistance management, those are some of the questions that we've been asked today about resistance management. Um, this is all coming from the chat, um, but you'll uh, also get real high efficacy from that multiple mode of action. So Angela, I do have one question um, that, um, so the um, link to this recording, um, are you going to be emailing that to everybody who has participated today? Yeah, so the recordings will be in the presentation that everyone will see. And then we will slowly be launching them onto our YouTube channel. Um, so you can stay tuned for that um, as well. But yes, Good. everybody wanted, will see I've, I've a copy that, of these. I've things. had that question asked in the chat okay. room for people that are leaving. Okay, yeah. let's go to the next slide. So the BioUnite approach, um, this is 
This is Marone marketing um, language at this point. What we've been looking at is how to use the best from the biological world um, with the best of the general pesticide world out there. So by combining them, we get the best, we get these multiple modes of action. Uh, we manage resistance for a long, a long time. Um, but I really like the fact that the um, we're seeing management of these uh, pesticide resistant populations, Western flower thrips, white flies, aphids, once you start using these materials hard in rotation and tank mixing, um, because of the multiple mode of actions coupled with their efficacy, it uh, for most growers, this is a really nice way to open up us. Very soft controls that are highly effective and safe for their staff to work in. Here's how you get hold of us. Um, and this is all available at our website as well. So for those of you who are looking for a quick link, we'll leave that up for a moment um, and you can see where your most regional person is. Um, you'll also have uh, Angela's email um, once she emails you and Angela will always refer you to which one of us you should be talking to as well. So if you're here in the Northeast from Virginia to Maine or from Delaware out to Ohio, please give me a call. And then here are all my colleagues. And this is a technical support team scattered around the country. Um, I'm on this one too. Um, so I wear two hats with Marone where I also do product development work. This whole team is led by Dr. Tim Johnson out of Virginia. and all the legal stuff. So somebody had asked if this was gonna be up again, here this very important information is, and I'm gonna turn this back over to Angela to finish this up, man. Awesome, thank you so much, Steve. And I apologize, we're running a little over our hour, but of course we, we as presenters are happy to stay on and answer any questions that you may have. Um, I know the chat has been going crazy. I'm sorry, the video is paused a few times. When I try to access the chat, it would pause the video, so. I think we've answered everything in the chat. Is that correct, Steve? I haven't been able to look at it. Yes, as far as far as I know, we are completely caught up. Awesome, awesome. There's, if one, you... there's one question from uh, Todor, Todorov. <clears throat> and his uh, question is uh, echinothrips, which is basically thrips. So I think we've answered thrips already. So hopefully we answered his questions. Uh, and then Johnny Escobar is how is working the nematodes to root aphid control? Um, I haven't had great luck with it. Um, what was um, what was our take on the nematodes for root aphid control? Um, the results that we haven't seen solid results um, as compared in our trials as well. Okay, um, definitely good for fungus gnat larvae, right. uh, but um, they don't seem to really get the root aphids and. Um, so you have a number of synthetic materials and then both Grandivo and Venerate do a pretty decent job. Um, so for um, so what I've seen, we have a lot of root aphids in the cannabis production um, and it's probably the worst thing you can get in it. So the stuff that we've been using and pretty effectively has been uh, drenches, uh, Venerate CG with um, some kind of biological, typically it's PFR 9.7 which is a, a biological, and then also, or um, Botanigard WP. Um, though that combination seems to work really well. Uh, you have to use it quite often though. It's not a one, one application. Uh, and then the other thing is if, um, you know, uh, Pyganic, uh, which is the uh, mechanic, Pyganic specialty, which is the organic version of uh, a pyrethrin, um, that can be used also as like an organic. That's a uh, that that'll basically take out you know all the insects in there, um, and you know you'll have to sort of follow up with some more biologicals after that. Um, that those are my kind of go go to sprays or drenches. Do we have any other questions? If not, I would love to hear in the chat if there are any um, requests for for other topics for greenhouse, you know, pest disease management in regards to biologicals. We always love to hear kind of what's on your mind or what you're struggling with or what you'd like to learn more about. Um, our focus is really to be just an educator and a source of quality information about biologicals and, and how you're growing your greenhouse crop. 
I see a couple of people raising hands. I'm not sure if that's an accidental tap or if that's indeed a question, uh, but we'll just hang on the line for a couple more minutes and make sure there aren't any other questions that we can't answer. As always, um, if you've attended our webinars before, you know you can expect an email within a few days, hopefully even yet today, with the presentation. If those of you that are attending are um, looking for Cal California DPR credits, I will have a quiz uh, in the follow-up email today. It's not gonna be posted right now in the link, I apologize, um, in the webinar chat, but it will be coming out later today or tomorrow with um, the quiz that you need to take and pass at a 70% uh, pass rate in order to get your California DPR credits. I will give you one week to complete that test. So next Friday, we will issue all the certificates for the California Department of Agriculture. For those of you in Oregon and Washington, we'll submit your names to those states. And then certified crop advisors, you need to um, make sure to scan here and we'll also be submitting a list there. Um, and with that, so all the videos will be in the presentation. So you should be able to just click on the video. The videos are hosted on YouTube right now, but it's a private place. So you won't be able to find them otherwise. It's only through this presentation right now. We will eventually be rolling them out on our YouTube channel as well. And um, by joining this webinar, you're automatically gonna receive a monthly newsletter from us on greenhouse topics. And, and we'll be providing resources in there. And then over the year, we'll be providing uh, you know, these videos again, in case you wanna watch them again. So with that, do we have any other final questions? I see one here, what fungicide um, do they use to control powdery mildew and botrytis? Okay, so we answered that in our last webinar. So you can certainly watch that or real quick, since we're all on the line, there might be other people that have the same question, Matt? Sure, so um, powdery mildew, um, obviously depends on what crop you're growing, but um, really our products that we have that work really well um, we have Regalia CG, um, you know, um, I'm from more familiar with it on the cannabis side. Um, and then of course the um, vegetable production. So we, we tend to use that weekly. Uh, the, the biggest um, rotational days is would be 10 days. So you can do seven to 10 days between applications. Um, but that's key, the seven days, seven to 10 days is key for how regalia works in the plant. It, it, it lasts for seven days uh, at the highest point and then peters down to about you know zero at day 10. So we like to do it every seven to 10 days to have maximum efficacy. Um, and then Xeritol or our product called Jet Ag, which is a um, peroxy acetic acid product. Um, though that's basically a, a disinfectant. So you can spray down the plant, basically wipes the powdery mildew right off of it. Uh, and the same thing for botrytis as well. It helps to sterilize the uh, spores and um, the, the mycelium. Um, and so those are the two kind of two major ones. There's a bunch of other products out there. Um, sulfur for uh, sulfur sprays are really, really good for um, powdery mildew. Uh, they also have the added benefit to go after some of the mites, especially russet mites. Um, there are uh, products like um, we'll try to think of what, what it's called. Uh, it's like a potassium bicarbonate. Basically, it uh, raises the pH so the spores don't germinate um, and has an adverse effect to the fungus. Uh, and so there's a couple of those. I think that is, those are sort of the more the biological safe options. And of course, you know, you have your regular other, you know, uh, fungicides out there you know, the strobulurins, the chlorothalonils, the all kinds of products out there that are not obviously more conventional pesticides. Excellent, Hopefully, thank uh, you. We've got a couple more here. I'm gonna, okay. before you do the next question, um, I just wanna do a shout out to Louis Traven, uh, Candy Traven, Alex Traven and their entire staff. They had us there for two days. We were everywhere and got in the way. Um, they were they were remarkable hosts and we did buy them lunch by the way. Uh, so <laughs> they, but they were remarkable hosts and without them, we just certainly could not have done this thing. So I know Lloyd was still on here. Yeah. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll look forward to stomping all over your place again. Thank you for doing that, Steve.
Um, and just one, we've got uh, some questions coming in here. Uh, there's one concern about the QR code here for the um, certified crop advisors. I understand it's for a future webinar we're doing for the palm for apples. I apologize, my colleague. Um, I think accidentally sent me the the wrong key, uh, the wrong form. So I will circle back and I'll update this. And in the follow up email, I'll make sure to to update that. I apologize for that. Um, but we do have a California, uh, or excuse me, a certified crop advisor credit for this webinar. So um, um, we have some additional questions here. Go ahead, Matt. Well, yeah, Todor, was that um, the question about root aphids, wasn't it? I think. Um, and, and you said, are those products aren't aren't they hurt by beneficial control uh, agents? Um, what are hurt by them? The root aphids. Root aphids, uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's any good beneficial insects for root aphids. Is that correct, Steve? Um, I haven't seen any programs that even try yeah. any beneficial agents. Any no, it, they agents. don't work very well. We, we've tried, um, like, what is it, Aureus and some of these other ones, or um, yeah. the, the beetle ones. They just don't work, yeah. Um, I see the question here is shelf life of Grandivo and Venerate. Um, so most Marone bio products um, have a three-year shelf life. Those, those certainly qualify. Um, so as always with any pesticide, don't, don't put them somewhere where you're going to cook them. Don't put them somewhere you're going to freeze them. Keep them between 45 and 85, and you'll get your three years out of them. Um, Grandivo is a uh, water dispersible granule. Don't get it wet. Make sure you close the bag up tightly between uses. Yeah, and just, to make, just to make sure everyone's clear, Grandivo is really safe with beneficial insects because it gets it tends to get into, well, how the mode of action works, it gets into the plant um, uh, epidermal cells. And that's, it's only basically the, the insects that feed on the plant are gonna be hurt by the Grandivo. And there's a little bit of agitation there, but in, in all reality, there's, there's not much uh, uh, killing that goes on to the beneficials when you use Grandivo. Venerate, there's a little bit more, but Grandivo, if you really wanna be super, super sure um, Grandivo CG is the way to go. Matt, about, you want to take care of club root? Um, <laughs> wait, I, I'm not seeing that question up on my on my chat, so I don't, I don't see is, it. The um, so question is, anything you'd recommend for club root? Club root? Yes, I know, uh, I know the disease club root. Um, it's a big problem in canola um, and brassicas. And um, we have a lot of ideas, but we haven't done a whole lot of work looking at club root. That's a, yeah, that's a big Canadian problem. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's very small. I would say very, it's smaller in the US right now. Yes. There's a question on here about how about liverwort control? I'm not really, uh, that's more of a, uh, was a herbicide, right? It would be more of a, no, but if you if you do um, regular uh, um, sprenches with a peroxyacetic acid material like jet, oh, yeah. you, will knock, yeah. you will knock the heck out of um, most algae and liver warts on the surface. You'll still see some, but um, that's usually for plants you're holding for a long time anyhow. Um, but if you if you're regularly doing sprenches, you can keep them under control. I just wanted to use sprench in a sentence today. That's a good, it's a good word. Yeah. yeah. Are most of these products applicable in hydroponic operations? And the answer is yes. Um, sure. Um, can you put it in, when you say hydroponic, um, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot, a lot of term hydroponic is thrown around a lot. So are you in, are you in full like um, high, uh, water? So in other words, you're in a, uh, um, a DWC or a deep water culture, or are you in an aeroponics kind of a, a hydroponics situation? I'm assuming, or is it a uh, flood and drain? If it is, it's totally fine. E either way, you can do it. Um, if you want to drench your roots and you're using a flood and drain system, um, the best way of doing it is to hand drench each of your pots. Um, <laughs> but you can you can do a. Uh, um, you, I guess you could. I guess you could put it into your drench system. Steve, you have any people doing that? Not generally. Usually, because the um, the capacity, the tanks are so large, you know. Right, it'd be really expensive. system, you know, you, yeah. you dilute pro you dilute things so much. I I tend to go a lot more foliar in, in in most hydroponic systems, especially with large capacity tanks. Okay. So um, one of one of our colleagues 
um, has uh, asked me to define sprinch. And so um, sprinch is, uh, is related to drench. Typically when you're drenching something, you want to fill that pot till it's just barely dripping out the bottom so that you know you've gotten full drench all the way through. A sprinch typically is you're trying to soak the top inch, which works really well for managing fungus gnats, uh, but you're trying to soak that top inch or so. Yeah, uh, so just uh, just to elaborate on Steve's. So um, for instance, uh, is a, there's a lot of um, uh, diseases, there's like stem rots. Uh, and that's really where we, we target um, uh, a sprench, right? So you're targeting kind of like maybe about this, this much up off of the, um, the soil and maybe about, you know, this much under the soil and that's about it. I see a comment here from Lloyd because um, they use ebb and flood benches. So there's, mm -hmm. there's an awful, they I mean, they have a large capacity. And so it definitely is a, is a problem when you're returning all that into these storage tanks. It's a, right. it's a, I wouldn't call it a limitation with hydroponic. It's just one of the things you need to be aware of. Yeah, most of my hydroponic guys who are doing rock wall or flood and drain or something or top down feed, they all go through, mix it up, you know, mix up their fertilizer mixes. Um, so they just they have a fertilizer mix or they can just drench by itself. Um, and you can just hand, hand basically hand top feed drench all of the plants. It's just a way, way better way of, you know, using your product. It's more direct um, and you're going to save a lot of money that way. Chat looks like it's quieting down. I think we get to get out of here. And we got a couple more questions. You see the Q&A. So um, is there any... Okay, so is there any compatible bioinsecticides and biofungicide products that work well together? So I'm thinking like oh. Jet Egg, Jet Egg and... Absolutely, yeah, we do these programs yeah. all the time. So Regalia plus Grand Evo CG, you know, rotated next week with uh, Regalia plus uh, Venerate CG. Or, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of products out there. You, you use the ones that you like and you're familiar with that work for you and you have to rotate them in with others. So. Um, but yeah, absolutely. A lot of these products are compatible together. Um, the only things that, you know, we, we kind of steer away from is if you do a sulfur application, make sure you don't put any kind of oil with it or vice versa. Um, and you wait like a week between apps. Um, anything more you want to say to that, Steve? Um, I just, I was just looking at the other question asking, how do ID aphids and thrips? And I'm like, oh, well, we could be talking about that all afternoon. Yeah. The <laughs> I think um, I think it's I think it's more biologically necessary. So if you're using a beneficial insect, I think that's more necessary. Um, but when it comes to just you know your sprays, I think it's more ubiquitous than anything. Yeah. All right. Um, There's a question from Evan about N NFT. So a uh, nutrient fil film technique, I believe it is. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I. I <laughs> Steve, why don't you take that one? You have more NFP, NFP than I do. <laughs> I mean, I have done, I have seen it used. Um, I have seen materials used in lettuce houses, um, but you know, um, that's about the only place. And, and generally um, all the materials are being applied foliarly and they're primarily bat battling aphids or powdery mildew. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you see what's the strategy used to control thrips? So this goes back to what we were talking about when, when Alex um, was, was talking about thrips. Thrips are, thrips are tough. And um, because they are, they have such, a, they're so good at developing resistance to materials, the number of pesticides that we've lost to thrips far outstrips the, the mode of actions that we actually have left. And so for one thing, um, I just assume in any crop that's going to get thrips is that you're, you've got them there. Um, from the very beginning, because the populations can be really low and they blow up really fast. And so the strategy that I've used now, I'm a, I'm a tomato, pepper, cucumber indoor grower. And so um, when we're controlling thrips, I just assume that I've got aphids or thrips or white flies all the time. And so the program that I would be using would be rotating Grandivo and Venerate but always mixing them with a tank mix partner, be it an insecticidal soap, um, one of the AZA materials, if you're not trying to run a BCA program, the very anti-Bassiani. And, and one of my colleagues, we were, we were having a, a sales meeting. We were talking about um, different materials that are out there. There's also a PFR 97, which is an Isaria fungus material. 
Um, I think I believe it was getting used in um, alfalfa. I think that material um, would probably be a fine tank mix partner for our products as well, and would give you some additional modes of action. Um, so you can you can build out your your uh, scheme for how you do this. The way I look at it is you've got your base material, which I rotate between Grandivo and Venerate. And then I'm always looking for what tank mix partner I'm going to use and then come back next time with something else. The idea is, especially for aphids and Western flower thrips and spider mites, is stay ahead of any possibility of, of seeing resistance build up. They, they get tough really easy. Hey, so this is not a, a, this is not a question on this chat, but I, we need to address this. Surfactants. So we get these questions all of the time, which, yeah. you know, do I need to use it for surfactant? And if I do, which surfactants do, should I be using? Um, and Steve, I'm gonna let you take, <laughs> what, what, well, do you, I think you know more of the ornamental surfactants people use. I have, I have the, 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 the ag versions that I know more of. So um, since this is an indoor one, um, I generally, um, if I don't, I, I, the most common one I would use would be a yucca extract. It's very compatible with um, all the biological materials. It doesn't change the pH of the solution, which is really important. And you get that spreading action that you need so badly for getting down in nooks and crannies for spider mites, white flies, Western flower thrips, uh, broad mites. Um, mm -hmm. If you are including a soap in the solution, you've got a spreading agent already in there. So if you're at one or 2% of an insecticidal soap, you've got a great spreader. You don't need a sticker indoor. Typically indoors, you get the pH of your solution between six and eight. That's good for most biologicals. You have a spreader of whether a yucca extract or a soap, and you're going to get the best. The high pressure sprayers make a big difference. We haven't talked about spraying much, but whether you're doing auto fog delivery or using a high pressure sprayer, um, I'm going to do a shout out to my favorite backpack sprayer here. Um, DRAM makes a, is a really good manufacturer of uh, greenhouse sprayers. Um, I have often used the DRAM BP4, and now they have their LI model. It's a backpack sprayer that puts out 150 PSI. Um, really nice sprayer, and the LI model's got a Makita battery you can snap in and out. Highly effective. It looks like two upside down tornadoes coming out the end, so you get an awful lot of coverage with a very little bit of water. Um, and so the way you spray matters a lot. If you take any of this outdoors, um, New Film P, which is a, a Miller chemical product, also has a sticker in it and it is a pH neutral. And the reason I'm mentioning these is we've tried these with our bio products. We know that they're very effective um, and they're widely available through um, whoever your supplier is. Um, also, I see Lloyd on here has uh, knowing and recognizing um, your beneficials by copper. I actually got a copy here. I should have, I should have uh, um, noticed that before or, or responded with that. Um, so there's, if you're trying to figure out what you've got, aphids are easy. You look at the dent in their head and their exhaust pipes and you can figure out which aphid you've got. The thrips, um, I'm not one of them. <laughs> I would add there, there was a question about um, anybody have any lens recommendations? And, yes, I know and, I, I, and I did get a response and the guy emailed me. Alex has a specific one that he showed me. I just forgot what the brand is. So mm -hmm. unless Lloyd is still on here and can uh, fill in which uh, hand lens Alex uses, um, I, will, I will talk to Alex and respond to uh, Roger personally. Excellent. We also have been um, sharing the Olo clip with some of our colleagues, it's a it, OLO, O-L-O -O clip. It's um, something you can literally attach to your iPhone or Android phone and you can, uh, over the camera, and so you can look at, you can magnify something looking at it through your phone, you know, so you have a bigger screen and then obviously you can take a picture. So OLO clip might be another option based on your needs. Um, we have a couple more questions. Okay, what are you guys, phone. okay. I see an auto fog question here. So let me, let me, uh, foggers are absolutely wonderful tools. You set them up, you can go away. You don't have to be in the house. They do an incredible job of getting into every nook and cranny, assuming that you have the right size fogger set up. Um, we were discussing this a little bit earlier in some of the, in, in an internal dialogue, uh, venerate auto fogs really well. 
My experience in the small auto foggers is Grandiva, which is on a very fine clay base, um, often leaves a sludge in the tank and it will leave some grit. Um, but one of my colleagues um, claims that he does it very successfully. Um, and you're asking about zero tolerance. So you say zero tolerance. I have to say Jet Ag 5. That's the product that, 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 that we sell. So I'll translate that. Uh, the parasitic acids, you can auto fog them. Make sure you spend the extra money on the special nozzle. Um, you need a, I believe it's a stainless steel nozzle in order to auto fog. The fogger nozzle that comes with an auto fogger, um, the uh, parasitic acid will tear it up very, very quickly. It's amazing how fast you will lose that. Also want to just add uh, one thing is um, if you're using some of the biological um, uh, sprays or, you know, um, products, I believe you need to be using the, a cold fogger for those. Um, yeah. So if like, if you're using something that with a live organism in it, make sure it's a cold fogger, I believe. Is that right, Steve? Yes, you are correct. You can use venerate through the standard fogger, but any, all those that are living, you don't want to, you don't want to cook Bavaria bassiani, and I'm just going to guess that uh, BT and um, Isaria probably don't appreciate the heat uh, from that nozzle. No, they don't. So bacillus might, the bacillus might uh, be a little bit better in them, but you know, in, in general, you're right. Um, okay, uh, we, have a, we have a couple more questions here. Uh, what precautions need to be made by oh, when spraying sulfur in a greenhouse environment, uh, thinking about heat days? And, and that's, um, yeah, that's right. So if it's, uh, if it's really hot, the plants are stressed out, it's something you may want to, um, you know, spray perhaps in the morning when it's cooler out. It's typically when you spray something and it's the hottest part of the day and the plants are already stressed out for something else, maybe they, they lack water or whatever. That's typically when we see some issues that happen um, with some of these sprays. Uh, but what I usually see it's because they've, they've combined it or they they put it too close to uh, um, and something with that's very oily, um, if I remember correctly. Uh, this one is for Steve, commercial hydroponic production, leafy greens and basil for complete yeah. coverage of the products is autofog best. Oh, we got that one already. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. Uh, we like the autofogs for sure. We mainly deal with aphid larger, so we're good. Uh, any, any luck with hypoaspis miles for fighting root aphids? Miles should be um, lowercase because it's a species. Um, but for, sorry, it's my, you're such a nerd. God. That's my nerdy guess in there. Uh, root aphids. Uh, okay. So I have not had any luck with any beneficial insects for root aphids. Unfortunately, again, my, um, my go-to regimen for, for root aphids, right. Is a, is if you can use it, is the pyganic specialty, which is an organic pyrethrin that you put that as a drench and drench it down and that'll take out you know, a lot of them. And then um, if you do more of a biological approach to it, you, you're going to need to use Venerate uh, CG plus either um, uh, PFR 97 or uh, Botanicar WP. Those are the two major ones people are, people are using with our products. Um, and the idea is that Venerate CG helps to, you know, um, open up, I guess, the exoskeleton of the insect to help the um, beneficial fungus to go down into it. So you get a double, you know, like a, a dual thing um, going on on that aphid. So they sure, they sort of um, kind of work together. Um, Steve, do you have anything extra to add? No, not a bit. All right. I think that's it. That's all our questions. Woo. All very, right. very awesome. Uh, you know, awesome engaged audience. Thank you guys so much for joining us today for the webinar and for hanging on. Uh, with all of your question and answer. So Lloyd, if you're still on, just a huge kudos to you and Alex and, and all the team at Peacetree for letting us come there, do the do those shooting, and of course the knowledge that you're sharing with us all. And Steve, thank you for leading the charge with the videos and, and sharing your wealth of, of knowledge and Matt as well. Um, it's been a great webinar. So please, you guys, you know, let us know what you want to learn more about in, in regards to biologicals or what the challenges, you know, the big challenges you're dealing with in greenhouses. We'd love to get your feedback and um, produce more information like this for you on a regular basis. So with that, we look forward to keeping in touch via email 
And if you have any questions, um, you'll, you'll have my email. And then, of course, you'll have all the contact information in the follow-up email in the, in the PowerPoint presentation. So with that, have a wonderful afternoon. Stay safe and healthy. Yes, Matt? Oh, can we just go back um, two slides to the sales reps? So just in case, we went through it pretty quick. So just in case, um, you know, people who are still online want to know who their rep is in their area. Um, this is this is the, the overall um, uh, rep sheet right now. So just why don't we just leave it up here for a couple of minutes before we sign off, just to make sure people can have some time to write down the name and uh, their phone number and email. You bet, or take a take a picture of it, right? Yeah. That's another good, quick way to do. Um, a screenshot, which I never figured out how to do a screenshot. One of these days, I'll figure out how to do that. Are you uh, on a doubt? So, so Colin is looking for an international rep. And so we, um, oh. we don't have any specific Maroon reps that are completely international. Where uh, is we Colin? We have contacts in a lot of countries. Colin, where are you? Yeah. Australia. Australia. Uh, <laughs> Australia okay. What are you what are you growing in Australia exactly? And I'll be I'll, I, if if someone will cover a two week vacation for me and my wife <laughs> down there, I'll be your Australia rep for a little bit. Seriously. Oh, oh, we got, I'm, Taylor, also, I'm also Taylor's available for Australia already. <laughs> First Taylor wanted to go. <laughs> Nursery crops indoor and outside. Oh, okay. Okay. So um yeah, the news the stuff that we um we talked about here today. All right. Are we able to ship? Would he be able to, to order uh, no, online? No, because we don't have any, uh, we're not, it's not, regu it's not regulatory in Australia yet. Yeah. Okay. You have to be approved products and all that stuff. And it, it takes a long time. We just, we just received approval for Grandivo, but it's on grapes um, in New Zealand. So we're <laughs> inching that way. Getting there. Um, yeah, yeah, but okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Colin. I'm sorry that sorry. hopefully you can find an alternative, you know, so you can still use biologicals. Um, do we have any other final questions here that? Okay. Angela, thanks, thanks for, for pulling good. all this together. Working My well. pleasure. All right. Happy Thursday, everyone. Take care. Take care. And we'll hopefully I'll see you soon. Okay. Bye-bye.